So it's, it's a joy to be with you. It's very special, and it's a special time of year. I am a Jewish believer uh, in Jesus. I've been a believer in Jesus since uh, I was 19 years old. It was not exactly what my parents expected me to do at my bar mitzvah, um, but uh, nonetheless, here I am. Uh, I was actually uh, born in the Holy Land, where I live, Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> where the bagels are large and you can't get a jalapeno one, just so you know. And so uh, I had a little journey. Uh, I was bar mitzvahed at the age of 13, like uh, most Jewish kids. I was a nice Jewish boy, went to actually pretty orthodox uh, Hebrew school. And then uh, after I finished my Hebrew school and finished my bar mitzvah, I did what a lot of Jewish kids did, and that is uh, sort of leave the synagogue behind. Although, of course, I lived in New York City, so everybody was Jewish, even the Gentiles. So, <laughs> well, they all got off for the holidays, so they must have been. And then uh, I went to college, and uh, unlike you, dropped out of college almost immediately, and went out to the only place in the world you could find the answers to life, San Francisco. <laughs> and it was there that uh, one of my uh, closest friends became a believer in Jesus, then my next closest friend became a believer in Jesus, and they were all involved with this Jesus movement thing, and uh, they were Jesus freaks, and I definitely thought they were freaks. And I said, Jews don't believe in Jesus. They said, but we do. I said, that, you know, that's a problem. I know you're Jewish. And so I began reading the Bible, my Bible, the only Bible. Christians call it the Old Testament. And uh, God began speaking to me. And one day I just sort of said, God, if you're really there, show me how to get to you. And I was working in a camp. Actually, some of you might know it. It's in Pescadero, Redwood Glen. But I was not working there as in a Christian capacity. I was working through the outdoor education program of, Mar of Marin County as an outdoor educational specialist, which I knew nothing about. I, did, I could tell the difference between a redwood tree and a bush. Okay? <laughs> and so one night after I prayed that prayer God showed me, I went down to the phone booth where there should have been a phone book. Now, some of you do not know what a phone booth is or a phone book, so you can look it up at Wikipedia or watch Doctor Who, whichever one, <laughs> you'll find out. And so there on the ledge where there should have been a phone book, glowing in the moonlight, streaming through the redwood trees, was a copy of a little funny book called Good News for Modern Man. I had no idea what it was. And I opened it up and it had odd chapter titles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who ever heard of that? And uh, I noticed the little, little figures. And one of the little figures was like a little skinny figure, you know, with long hair. So I figured, oh, that must be Jesus, you know. That's the way they portrayed him. And then I looked in the front, modern English version of the New Testament. I put two and two together. I asked God to show me and show me how to get to him. That night, I find a New Testament in a phone booth. So I knew I could only do one thing. So I stole the New Testament. <laughs> and so I began, I began reading the New Testament. And lo and behold, I discovered something that was shocking to me. And maybe you don't know this, but I, I certainly did not know it. Jesus is Jewish. What a shock. In fact, I'll give you a free copy of my latest book, which I don't know what that is, but I will give you a free copy of, of some book. Uh, if you can find out one spot in the New Testament where Jesus celebrated Christmas or Easter. <laughs> he did not. He celebrated Passover. He celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles that I'm going to speak to you about today. And I knew that I was coming face to face with a, a Jewish person who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. And thousands of years of objections melted because I thought he was a convert who hated Jews. Because that's the way I was raised in New York City. Christians were not the friends of Jewish people. Little things like the Holocaust and things like that were blamed at, on Christians. But I had never even met a Christian until I met some of my friends. Friends. And I began putting two and two together, and uh, before I knew it, I found my heart believing before my head agreed. <laughs> and uh, finally, they caught up enough for me to give my life to Jesus the Messiah. And, it, and it's been a journey, a wonderful journey ever since. And uh, over the years, I've been able to serve the Lord and 
21 years ago, became the president of Chosen People Ministries. Now, I'm going to give you a little history. I don't often do this, but this is Biola, so you need to know this. So Chosen People Ministries used to be called the American Board of Missions to the Jews. I'm so glad they, they changed the name. It never would have fit into a URL. So, <laughs> and so Chosen People Ministries... And it was in the late 20s that Chosen People Ministries led a young Jewish guy to the Lord who was studying to be a rabbi by the name of Charles Feinberg. And so Charles Feinberg was the first dean of the Talbot School of Theology. And so we are united. I also happen to be a Talbot grad. I had to pay them to let me graduate, but it's, <laughs> so, it's okay. Uh, we also uh, named our institute in Brooklyn the Charles Feinberg Center for Messianic Jewish Studies. We are an MDiv in Messianic Jewish Studies that is part of Biola, part of Talbot. So we are you all. How's that? You want me to t speak New Jersey? We are yous <laughs> in the heart of Orthodox Jewish Brooklyn. And some of you have not come and visited and shared a bagel with us yet. You, you, must, you must come. We're very friendly. And uh, we, we'd love you to come and visit. And some of you might even be called of God to serve among the Jewish people. You can come to Talbot in Brooklyn. What do you think of that? It's, yeah, it's great. You don't have any sun, but you have subways. So it's, it's a great place to study. And you can get your degree. Well, over the years, the journey of understanding who I am now as a Jewish person, believing in Jesus because I was told all my life that Jews don't do that. <laughs> and yet, I woke up the next morning after getting saved, and I kept waiting to become a Gentile, and it just never happened. <laughs> and my heart, my yearning to identify as a Jew grew stronger because I now knew the God who called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees. I knew the God who made the promises that were fulfilled to make me a Jew. And that same God revealed himself through the Tanakh, the Old Testament scriptures. And my life has been a journey to understand the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and to somehow apply them to my life and to apply them to the lives of my wonderful Gentile Christian family in Christ. And so that's what I'm going to try and do uh, today. By the way, the New Testament was written by Jewish people too, just so you know. <laughs> Some say Luke was a Gentile, but what did he do for a living, do you know? He was a doctor. So how many Gentile doctors do you know? So. <laughs> okay, you can see the kind of education you get at Talbot. So. <laughs> so we're going to just take a quick look. The Lord spoke again to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. Now, there's one a week, the Sabbath, and there's seven for the year. Four in the spring, three in the fall. We have no time to talk about the spring. We're going to talk a little bit about the fall, and, and we're going to focus a little bit on the seventh one, which is tabernacles. Uh, we, uh, some of us see a tremendous symbolism in these festivals. We, we almost see them as prophecies in type. And uh, so every one of these Old Testament festivals sort of looked forward to a greater festival or a greater event. So, for example, the easiest one to understand is Passover. So Passover looks forward to something greater, a greater day of redemption for the Jewish people. When we end the Passover, we sing a song, L'Shana Haba Birushalayim. Next year, we will be in Jerusalem. Hasn't worked out yet, except if we've gone on a tour. You know. <laughs> so next year, we will be in Jerusalem. It speaks to the greater hope of redemption Jewish people have. God delivered us from Egypt. We're still free, but there's something better coming, something more coming, something more robust, a more dynamic, a more dramatic fulfillment coming. And so, of course, we understand that in a sense... There are always uh, two fulfillments when we look forward to a greater day of redemption because we know that there was a first coming and will be a second coming, right? And so Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the very fulfillment of Passover. He is our exodus, and through him we enter into new and abundant life. 
But that's not it, because one day God's promises will still be true. There will indeed be a greater exodus because there are promises about God restoring his Jewish people to the land of Israel, and we already see some of that happening. And one day the king will come, his second coming, and he will reign on his throne in Jerusalem. He will gather the Jewish people from around the world, and the Gentiles will be included, and we'll all dance the horror in Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's a grand view of redemption. And so a lot of these festivals speak to something uh, future. Now, we're going to look at the Festival of Tabernacles. Sorry, did I go the wrong way? Backwards. Forwards, okay, good. It's very complicated. <laughs> we're about to enter uh, the se- we have entered the seventh month, but we're about to observe the holiest day of the Jewish year. And so we have already observed Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of the shofar. Anybody hear a shofar blown? Anybody? The ram's horn? You haven't. Well, be thankful I'm not going to do it for you this morning. My mother never uh, told me to practice the trumpet. A little bit of piano, but not the trumpet. But it makes a blaring sound. And in fact, some people say, oh, I heard a shofar and it was just wonderful. Obviously, the person blew it wrong. Okay, the shofar is blown is blown to call attention to what's ahead, and that's the Day of Atonement. In fact, there are two things the rabbis say, that we blow the shofar to scare the devil away, and if you heard it blown correctly, you would understand that. (laughs) The second thing is we blow the shofar to make us feel uncomfortable in our own skin, but particularly in our own sin. And so the shofar is blown on the first day of the seventh month of the Jewish year, which was a few days ago, and we blow the shofar at Rosh Hashanah to begin 10 days of repentance. And so we have 10 days, according to the rabbis, to repent of our sins, to make things right with God, to make things right with other people. And if at the end of the 10 days, we feel or God understands that we've done a good job, well, then we are uh, forgiven. Of course, I've asked a lot of uh, my Jewish friends and family do you, do you know whether or not you're forgiven after Yom Kippur? And the usual answer is, I don't know. So pray for the Jewish people, beginning Tuesday night and Wednesday is the culmination of these 10 days of repentance. And it's probably the only time of the Jewish, of the year, when a lot of your Jewish friends, associates, and family members think about sin and forgiveness and atonement. So it's a very serious time of year. I was handing out uh, tracts at Rutgers University some years ago, And of course, Yom Kippur is in the fall. And I was wearing a sweatshirt as I was handing out gospel tracts because I felt like we needed to be real subtle and sensitive. And so it it said, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, something like that. (laughs) That way no one would know. And it was dark blue and white letters. Anyway, so I was handing out the tracts and and a rabbi came running towards me. And uh, he started taking the tracts out of the hands of some Jewish people and said, are you Jewish? They said, yes. He took the tract out and he said, here, read this. So I looked at him and I said, what are you, God censor? He smiled at me and his name is, was, is Baruch, which means blessing. And so I said, so Baruch, what's been a blessing to you? Because certainly you have not yet been a blessing to me today. So what's, what, was a blessing to, what was a blessing to you this holiday season? We're both from New York. It's okay. <laughs> so I said, what was the blessing to you? And he says, oh, everything about the holidays is a blessing. And I said, did you fast on Yom Kippur? Were you supposed to fast? He said, yes. He said, did you fast? I said, of course, I always fast. And uh, then we go back and forth. And I said, so, Baruch, when you walked out of synagogue, did you feel that your sins were forgiven? And he says, oh, you Christians, you make it so easy. You think that the Messiah died and all you, gotta, all you have to do is believe and whammo, your sins are all forgiven. I said, well, it's close, close. <laughs> close. And I said, come on, Baruch, forgiven or not forgiven? He says, well, you know, I said, come on, which way is the wind blowing? He said, okay, I, even if I was forgiven, I'd walk out of synagogue and I'd sin again. And then I'd have to begin the whole process all over. I said, yeah, that's right. Now, he wasn't supposed to say that because Jewish people do not believe in the depravity of man, that man is innately sinful. So he was being very un-Jewish in his comment. 
says, but I believe I will, sin, I will sin when I walk out, so I've got to repeat it over and over. So the important thing in life is not really salvation, it's repentance. I said, whoa. I said, Baruch, I am so grateful for your encouraging me today. He said, really? I said, yeah, you reminded me of how grateful I am to know that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. He died once for all, for all sin, for all time, for all mankind, Jews and Gentiles. And I know that I am forgiven, and I have the joy of forgiveness. And he said, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> now, uh, oh, I see. It's not changing there. That's my problem. It's a little slow. Okay. Okay. So we're going to the seventh one. You have Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the final harvest feast. It's the Feast of Fruit. The Lord said to Moses, say to the sons of Israel, on the 15th of the seventh month is the Feast of Booths. So we'll see that a little bit later uh, this month, um, into October. On the first day is a holy convocation. So gather together, don't do any work, Listen, if, if you like taking days off, you should become Jewish. <laughs> All these holidays, we have more days off. And once a week on the Sabbath. Okay, but then again, if you really believe in a five-day work week, you won't, like, you won't like the Torah because it's a six-day work week. So. so on the first day is a holy convocation. Gather, don't do any work of any kind. For seven days, pre present an offering by fire to the Lord. Offerings were important. Uh, part of the, it was a, essential to worship. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation, present an offering by fire to the Lord. So it was an eighth-day festival as well. Don't do any laborious work. Don't work. Set time aside. Do it when I tell you. Convene together. Offer sacrifices. And that was the nature of these festivals. In fact, every festival should be viewed as a retreat where you go off and you focus on God. Uh, the holidays, the Jewish holidays, are never convenient. In fact, what you have to do is plan your year around the Jewish holidays, just like average Americans plan their family vacations and the year around Thanksgiving. Every Jewish person has seven festivals to plan around, <laughs> and a lot of them last a week. And so you have to plan your life, and it's a constant reminder that the God of the universe demands all of us in all of our time. Time is what he gives us. Time is what we give back to him. We honor him by honoring his role in our life through the way we use our time. And so the festivals are a reminder that we order our lives around God's plan and not vice versa. It's a great reminder, let me tell you. Every Jewish holiday has a couple of different types of things that we do to uh, remember different things. So we do the lulav and the ethrog, or uh, ethrog, esrog, when you use a soft S on the Hebrew. On the 15th of the seventh month, when you've gathered the crops, celebrate the feast for the Lord for seven days, the rest on the eighth. Now, on the first day, take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and you shall re rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Day. So we're actually commanded to rejoice on tabernacles, which is really, really good, let me tell you, because Rosh Hashanah, we're supposed to start repenting. That's a little depressing. Yom Kippur, you don't eat. That's not fun. And then you get to Sukkot, and you can let, just let it out, you know? And so we actually take this lulav and esrog, you have to see it, and we march around the synagogue, shaking it down and up and around east and west and north and south to remind us that God is in control of all things and that we're grateful to God for this final fruit harvest. Also, Jewish people actually pray for rain, if you can believe it. So Californians should send thank you notes to the synagogues. <laughs> we pray for rain because we know that the final harvest We'll, we'll never come around again unless God provides the rain, which if you've been in Israel in January and February, you know that he does. And so uh, we, we do that. The next uh, part is living in booths. You shall live in booths for seven days. All native-born in Israel shall live in booths. And this is really fun. So all Jews go camping during tabernacles, even the Jews in Brooklyn. 
And so let me show you where we live as we go camping. That's a booth. If you're orthodox, you live in the booth. You eat in the booth. If you're not as orthodox, you just eat in the booth. If you're not orthodox at all, well, you don't live in it, you don't eat in it, you don't even make one, you go visit someone else's. And uh, these booths have to be open on the top to remind us that God is overall so you can see the stars and so the rain can fall on you. What, what do the rabbis say about you're getting wet? They say, dry off. Okay. So these are some other sukkah booths these days, even among the most orthodox Jews in Brooklyn. We actually have sukkah booth kits. Moses would not believe it. They're canvas kits. They're like pop-up tents, but pop-up sukkah booths. Now, it's really hard to get palm branches in Brooklyn to put over your, uh, your booth, but we find all sorts of things so that we can be reminded of the frailty of life. The best place to build a sukkah booth is on a fire escape. And uh, so that's very convenient, and you can see the design. <laughs> and so we love building these booths on fire escapes because if you are religious, you know, it, it's not too far to go out there and, and eat your meal. You know, the Orthodox Jews have a lot of children, so if you have, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12 children, it's a, it's a tight squeeze, let me tell you. But great for family life. <laughs> now, the Gentiles have a place in the Feast of Tabernacles. Look at Zechariah 14, just in case you were feeling left out. And I know some of you might be watching on the live stream. We love you too. Don't feel left out. Then it will come about in the last days that any who are left among the nations that went against Jerusalem will go from year to year to worship the King of, Ho of Ho the Lord of hosts and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whoever, whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts will withhold rain, which of course is quite the judgment. So when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom in Jerusalem, I'm glad that we all now know that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's actually been that way for thousands of years. But the king, Jesus, will fulfill the specific prophecies in the Old Testament and will reign in Jerusalem, and the whole earth, in a sense, will become a sukkah booth and you all will be invited to celebrate tabernacles. I just hope they're not apartment buildings. Now, there's a day coming after that, too. Remember, I said it looks forward. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And listen to this promise. I love this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Good friend of mine in Australia sent an email today and said that his brother was killed uh, in South Africa in a crime. He's, he said, just another, another criminal event in Cape Town. And I wrote him back and I said, my dear friend, one day the Lord will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death, no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So the day is coming when we will live forever in God's sukkah booth. The curse of sin will be lifted completely. We will be, those of us who know him, in our eternal bodies, and we will live in the presence of the Lord and the Lamb forevermore. You're looking forward to that day? Well, if you are, build a sukkah booth on campus this week. <laughs> you know, build a little sukkah booth. There are Jewish believers here who will help you, and maybe... Get out a sleeping bag, sleep there for a night, and if you have, a tr if you have trouble with an RA, just give them my phone number. <laughs> now, closing it up. Did you know that Jesus celebrated tabernacles? In fact, he was the tabernacle. In John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. We saw his glory because his glory was veiled, veiled by the tabernacle, which was his flesh. And we saw his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father full of grace and truth. And actually, one of the most dramatic statements Jesus ever made was made on tabernacles. It's in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. This was the great day of the feast, Hoshana Rabbah, where they did the ceremony of the water drawing, D-R-A-W-I-N-G. I have a New York accent. It sounds a little strange, so. And in the ceremony of the water drawing, 
the priests in the temple would go down to the pool of Siloam and gather up uh, urns filled with water, march back to the temple, and they would go back to the temple, and there would be the Levitical choir. There would be uh, flautists and people playing drums and uh, people uh, shouting and dancing. And they were shouting, Hoshienu, Hoshienu, Lord, save us. And on the seventh day, Hoshana Rabbah, in the temple during the times of Jesus, they would walk around seven times shouting, Lord, save us, Lord, save us. Pour your rain upon us. By that time, they had believed that the rain they were praying for at Tabernacles was the rain of the Holy Spirit promised in Joel chapter 2. And the rain of the Spirit was associated with the coming of the Messiah. And they said, Lord, Send your rain upon us. Lord, save us. Send your rain upon us. Lord, save us. If you could imagine just the noise that was going on, and into the middle of this dramatic scene, a young Galilean carpenter marched to the front, and he said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because he was yet glorified. In other words, what Jesus, Yeshua, was saying is, you're asking for salvation. You're asking for the Messiah. You're asking for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? I'm here. And if you believe in me, all that you dreamed about and hoped for of an abundant life in knowing God and knowing his Spirit, will flow from your sukkah booth on out. And that, my dear friends, is the message of tabernacles for us as followers of Jesus. We have this frail sukkah booth that God has given us a gift, as a gift to nurture and live in for this life. But now he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to transform our earthly existence into a heavenly existence on earth because heaven dwells within us. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.